hello everyone, this is Bob Tribe, and welcome to another episode of Valley to Vietnam. Uh, today our guest is Dennis Drennan. Dennis? My pleasure to be here. Thanks for being here, and uh, thanks for your service. It's an honor. Um, we just interviewed uh, Dennis's twin brother, David, so I'm going to be asking a lot of the same questions. Um, hopefully I give you the same answers. <laughs> and hopefully I won't mix up your names. Uh, so Dennis, you were born in Berkeley. I was. Um, my parents uh, had met at Fort Gordon, Georgia during uh -huh. World War II. My mother was a uh, an army nurse, uh -huh. and my father was an engineer officer in the army. Okay. And uh, and after they met, my father went to Europe. My mother went to the Pacific Theater. Uh huh. And uh, my mother had a a brother who lived in Oakland, and so they met kind of the center point of the world at that time oh, okay. uh, back in Oakland, and uh, that's when they got married. And my brother and I were born in Berkeley. Well, you know, you both could have ended up being hippies rather than soldiers. You know. Yeah, we, about the time <laughs> hippiedom came along, we were doing other things. Yeah, so. obviously, yeah. So when you were about two years old, you moved to Sacramento? Yes, uh, the, uh, our, my father worked for the Army Corps of Engineers after he got out of the Army, and uh -huh. uh, they, the, the Corps had an office in San Francisco, which is where he started, and okay. uh, then they opened up an office in Sacramento, and so he moved up and was kind of the vanguard of that office. And initially you folks lived in veteran housing, Yes, there was a, a lot of people don't know this, but there was, uh, well, there was a shortage of housing um, because nothing was constructed during the Depression and during World War II. Yeah. And uh, so when you had all the returning military, the veterans coming back and a lot of them settling into Sacramento, um, there wasn't enough housing. So they had this, it was the project. So, yeah, that's what that and, became, uh, that area became. Yeah, the project. and um, so we spent the first couple of years of our, well, we moved up here when we were two, and so we lived there from the age of two to the age of four, and that's some of my earliest memories. Is yeah. Fishing in that little lake that oh, sure. parked across yeah. the, the highway. That's where my grandson fished. So. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then you moved to Arden Park. Yes, my father uh, started building a house. Um, it took him about a year to build it. He built it all by himself, uh, and wow. it was one of the first homes uh, in Arden Park. It was and it's still standing. Arroyo Grande, it's still standing. The quarter acre lot, um, three bedroom, one bath house. Yeah. And, uh, and then my father, uh, he co-founded the Arden Little League. Okay. And uh, which still goes today. And he was involved in the Little League for many, many years. He uh -huh. played semi-professional baseball before World War II. And, yeah. Okay. So Arden Park, for those who don't know it, is bounded by Watt Avenue. Uh, Fair Oaks Boulevard, um, Eastern Avenue, and Arden Way. So it became a huge area, heavily populated. It's almost like a, a city, right? Really. Um, so you had Cresta Park, you had Arden Park. We used to play football in Cresta Park. I remember as a kid, and, uh, and I know you probably were active in all those sort of things. And, right, uh, La Sierra Park, uh, right. Park, yeah. yeah. Um, and we spent most of our time there. Um, you know, it was a time in the 1950s, you had the baby boom generation, so every block had a lot of kids about our age. And so there was enough kids on every street or every block to form a baseball team or a football team. And sure. so there was just an awful lot of pickup <laughs> games. Um, you know, head to the park, and it was a Royal Grande against Cresta Drive or, uh -huh. or El Racon or whatever, you know. Sure. And uh, um, baseball was, was big in Sacramento in those days. Uh, our goal every year was to get a brand new baseball in springtime, and uh, by the fall, we'd knock the cover off of it. <laughs> we used to go down to Edmonds Field and watch the Sacramento Solons, and sure. uh, back then, it wouldn't be. Not many people would be at the game, and, yeah. and you get the broken bats, and so we would collect those bats and take them home and put some you know, glue and some screws in there and put some tape around it, and we had a professional baseball bat, and we just thought we were the coolest thing going. So. And, yeah, in Edmonds Field, I used to go to games there too, and that's where the target is now at Riverside and Broadway. Right. They got a couple of old historical markers there telling you that the field was there. Mm -hmm. Back yeah. there. Harvey's hamburgers right across the street. Oh, yeah, yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. uh, 
uh, Edmonds Field, the first time I ever saw Willie McCovey was at Edmonds Field. Phoenix came to town, and that was the Giants, you know, Triple A team back then. And right. he was impressive as everybody was yelling at him. Move him up to the big leagues, you know. Mm -hmm. They thought it was cheating having him in Triple A. Right. <laughs> so, but yeah, he was one of my favorite players. Um, so, you just talked about how, though being so close to the American River, it was like something out of you know Mark Twain or Huckleberry Finn or right. Whatever. It was the uh, that'd be the south side of Fair Oaks Boulevard between Fair Oaks Boulevard and the American River. That's pretty much undeveloped. Uh, at that sure. time, it was all fields. In fact, when we first settled in Arden Park, my brother and I would chase deer and rabbits around Arden wow. Park uh, and, and all down along the river. And yeah. um, so we spent a lot of time down there. Uh, and we had a lot of freedom of movement as kids in those days. I mean, there, there wasn't much concern about safety, you know, right. just don't do anything too stupid, <laughs> which we tested at times. but. Um, now we spent a lot of time on the river fishing, hunting, just hanging out at the river. With our what friends. would you hunt? A quail, oh, really? pheasants, ducks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's amazing to think that you could fire shotguns down there, you know, yes. given all the, the housing that's down yes, there. Yes, I mean, so. it's, yeah, it's amazing. But I still remember those hop fields stretching from the back, the, across the river from Sac State going forever. As Maybe far as you could see. Slough right. house. You right, know, right. So it was one of the jobs my brother got. Yeah, you had Shelby Ranch right there at Watt yeah, Avenue in the sure. river and uh, Tiker, Tiker yeah. construction and yeah, you know, I mean it was just an awful lot of open space out there. In high school we would have some beer parties down there once we had cars and the sheriff's department would raid those every now and then mm -hmm. so that always added a little adventure. Everybody had to try to escape and cross the river and hopefully not drown. <laughs> but you know, in, in those days too, I mean, you, you knew a lot of the police officers or they True. knew your parents or whatever. Yeah. And the worst thing that they would do would be to pour your beer out. I mean, right. That's it, it was a different time yeah. than it is now. They wouldn't arrest you, they'd take you home. Take I, you I, home or... They'd take me home a few times. Yeah, or, or they'd call home and when you got home, you'd be talking to the police about protective custody from your dad, you yeah. know, I mean, for protection. You know, right. so, yeah. I remember the highway patrolman, Jerry Delisle, I don't know why I remember his name, but he stopped me one time and he says, hey Bob, didn't you see me right there? You know, I mean, would that ever happen today? No, <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, first name basis. Right? Yeah, exactly. So, but, uh, so did you hang out at any particular places? Did you guys go to Shakey's Pizza or any of that sort of stuff? Yeah, I went to Shakey's Pizza when I was in college at Sac State because the original one was right across. Yeah. Boulevard. I thought there. it was a local place. And I get in the service, I go to South Carolina. There's a shape. Yeah, and that, that was, was the original. Uh, yeah, that one. amazing. So, yeah, I mean, you know, I, before I went to service, I spent way too much time at a local pool hall and down at Hagen Oaks uh, Golf Course and uh, Hoffman oh. Park Golf Course when it first opened. Oh, sure. Yeah, I used to play there all the time, both of those places, yeah. but mostly in Slough Hoffman. And then did skiing. You, I did, did a lot of skiing. Oh, yeah. Yeah, skiing was really big for Sacramento people because, you know, 90 minutes you could be on the slopes. And right, you could get up on a winter morning and look outside and it was a nice blue sky. You, yeah. know, you grabbed your skis and you went off and you were home for dinner. And so would you go to Soda Springs or...? Um, mostly skied Soda Springs. And yeah. then when Squaw Valley opened in, you know, really about 1960 with the Olympics, that's when the then you Squaw get we went there. Some real hills when you go got to in some real, And we got on some hills there that, quite honestly, I didn't belong on, you know, but <laughs> back then I probably had more guts and brains. Yeah, and, well, that's why you ended up in Airborne, you know. Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> um, so anyway, that was a pretty great existence. I know we'd just take off in the summer when we were off from school and tell, okay, Mom, I'll see you at dinner. And parents didn't worry about it. I always got a kick out of the term arranging play dates. I'm thinking, oh my God, you know, uh, mm -hmm. you just fill in with people your age yeah. and that's the way it worked. But. Now we, you know, if we were sitting around a house, our parents would say, you either get out and go do something or exactly. we're going to put you to work. Exactly. And so that was a real easy decision to make at the time and that we always, were gone. And then, like you said, well, you know, you, as long as you're home for dinner and, and if you weren't home for dinner, and, Peanut butter and jelly sandwich that you made yourself. I mean. Exactly. We got peanut butter and jelly and bologna sandwiches a lot. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so uh, you, like your brother, had a paper route. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I remember I had a Sunday morning uh, union paper route and a uh, 
afternoon Sacramento B route. Right. So at the same time. Then you had the Chronicle also. But yeah. I, I think my brother had the Chronicle route. Yeah. In order to get enough customers, you had to pedal a long way. So. Oh my God, that was huge routes. And, and the Union actually was a pretty huge route too because mm -hmm. of the B, I did 90 papers in like three streets and the Union was just scattered because not as many people took that. So you had a huge, right. huge route. Right. A lot of people now don't even know about the Sacramento Union because that yeah. That probably folded up, it's I'm guessing, gone. what, in the 70s, something like that. Yeah, so. probably late 70s, early yeah. 80s, yeah, it was gone. Yeah. Um, so you went to school, same places that your brother did, of course. Went, went to uh, same grammar school and, and high school. Yeah. We uh, started kindergarten at Arden School, and, uh, and then first grade Marymount School opened up, and yeah. so we went there through sixth grade and then back to Arden School for junior high, seventh and eighth grade. And then to El Camino. Right. And you graduated there in 65. Graduated in 1965. Yeah. Barely. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was gone by then. I had already graduated by the time you guys started there. So, But um, good school. And, and, you know, at that time it was considered one of the best college prep high schools in town. Right. I don't know how it's rated now. I think it still does pretty well because it's a fundamental, fundamental. high school they call yeah, it now. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, we just had our 50th high school reunion. Uh, Oh, a couple months, a few months ago. Uh, Bob Rossi lent Bob Rossi. me the, uh, mm -hmm. the DVD, so I have that, my own okay. copy, mm -hmm. and, uh, and that's how I found, you know, a lot of veterans right. is watching that. Yeah. And, you know, I think one thing that's important to note on going to school is that a lot of us probably started kindergarten, and we all grew up in, in Arden Park, and, uh, you know, went through the, the, all that school system, and... Uh, um, many of us started kindergarten or first grade together and went all the way through high school. So, yeah. I mean, some, some close bonds were formed over those years. <clears throat> sure. Yeah, I felt the same. I still, a lot of those guys that I met at Oroville Wright School and then Star King um, are still my friends. Right, you know? right. So, um, so, once you finished high school, what did you do? Well, I went to uh, American River College for one year okay. and uh, uh, spent a lot of time at Hagen Oaks, the pool halls, and skiing, and um, found out that wasn't part of the academic curriculum. And I think I finished the first year of college with a 0 0.5 GPA, <laughs> something like that. And, um, and I was doing some things that, you know, probably didn't make my dad real happy. And, um, and in fact, I came home one night with his car. Don't know if I put this in the write-up or not, but uh, I came home with his car, and uh, I'd been out with some friends. I had an empty beer can hanging on my dad's car's antenna. Contents of a couple more in me. Now, did you have his permission to take the car? I had his permission to take the car, but to take it responsibly. Yeah. I missed that second part. <laughs> and uh, so when I got home, I didn't think I could drive or could walk from the driveway to the front door, so I took the car up across the front lawn and parked <laughs> it next to the front door. And it was midweek, and, you know, school night, and so my dad got up in the morning waiting for his carpool. He sat down at the kitchen table at the front of the house, and he looked out and saw the car parked on the front lawn with an empty beer can on the antenna, and he knew who had it last. And so he uh, rudely awakened me, uh, and he said, when I get home, I want you signed up for the Army. <laughs> and a week later, I was in Fort Lewis, Washington. Wow. So, and in fact, I'm still called Evil Dennis <laughs> by a lot of my friends. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've got one to better you on that. I, we were either 14 or 15, and I had a key made to my far, Pat's 55 Ford station wagon. And then we'd have so-called slumber parties, mm -hmm. and we'd push the car down the street and start it up. And, uh, I came home one night about 4 o'clock and all the lights are on in the house. Mm -hmm. That was a bad night, bad morning, I should say. Um, so, but if I may, Bob, one on. other thing, you know, about that time, um, and again, this was 1965, 1966, uh -huh. and, um, and quite honestly, you know, when I was going to college that first year, you know, I, I really didn't know what I wanted to do in life. I, you know, I didn't have any real direction. And, yeah. So I was kind of floundering, and, and uh, which one of the reasons I didn't pay attention to my studies, and uh, 
you know, and then Vietnam was starting up, and you know, growing up in Arden Park in the 1950s, um, you know, you heard a lot of the, the adults, including our parents, talk about World War II. Sure. And you know, it, it was kind of a, a noble undertaking. You know, when you listen to them, I mean, they weren't necessarily pro-war, but you know, again, yeah. it was a noble undertaking. They did the right thing. You know, the greatest generation. You know, and we listened to, to that type of discussion. And you know, when I heard them talking about that, and then Vietnam was coming along, I was thinking, this will be, you know, our moment right. in, in our generation. Right. And then about that time. Um, uh, Staff Sergeant in the Special Forces by the name of Barry Sadler, Staff Sergeant Barry Sadler. He put out a song that became number one. Number one, 1966. You know, yeah, and uh, Ballad of the Green Berets. Oh, man, that sounds cool, you know, and uh, jumping out of airplanes and doing crazy stuff. So, you know, that became an attraction. And so when my dad told me to, you know, go get signed up for the Army, I, I was probably mentally prepared to go do that anyhow. Right. You know, I, it's funny you say that because, uh, of course, I had a very similar experience. Just about every dad in my neighborhood, and we grew up in the Garden of the Gods, had been, you know, uh, in World War II. And right. we listened to all those stories. Plus, we watched those damn John Wayne movies, you know, a guy who never went to war. Right. Uh, read those Sergeant Rock com comic books, mm -hmm. had, you know, little action figures, uh, G.I. Joe's, oh, yeah, and yeah. Little plastic. all that stuff. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. and uh, Play war in your backyard with the little plastic soldiers with your BB gun shooting them exactly. and throwing firecrackers at them. Yeah. Sure. And all these all these guys in the movies, they got those clean wounds. You know, you could hardly tell they'd been shot and mm -hmm. it just seemed right. like, right. oh, that's not so bad. Yeah, um, right. So, but, um, so you join the Army and you head to basic training at Fort Lewis. Yes. Uh -huh. And that's where I was introduced to Staff Sergeant McNeil, my drill instructor. Tell us about him. That was in September of 1966, and I've never forgotten Sergeant McNeil. Yeah, he was pretty tough. He was tough. Yeah. But a good guy. Yeah. yeah. I mean, he, he prepared as well. <laughs> right. Yeah. I still remember my NCO group in basic training, too, and they were all pretty good men. Mm -hmm. uh, real country. And I, I, one of the things I really identified with that you talked about was my whole life, essentially my whole remembered life had been California. And then suddenly I'm in the most diverse population you can get in and still be in the United States. You know, kids, you know, African-American kids from New York who were gang members and bricklayers from Philadelphia and Southern, you know, farmers and cowboys from Texas. and. I just, I was fascinated by all the lang different language and I almost needed, needed an interpreter for some of those guys from Mississippi. Right, right. Uh, and to me it was just, it was really interesting. It was an awakening, yes. Yeah. So, I mean, uh, uh, first of all, when I went to Fort Lewis, Washington, my first trip on an airplane, you know, I've never been on an airplane in 1966 and I'm what, 18 years old. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and then going into these barracks and you know, like I say, I mean, just there's people from inner city Philadelphia, Southern boys, you know, sure. um, highly educated people. I mean, that back in the days of the draft, and so yeah. you really had kind of a, a full cross section of American society there. And you know, for somebody growing up in Sacramento, Arden Park, you know, through the 50s and 60s, <laughs> where that's it was the all area. Caucasian. I mean, yeah. you know, um, yeah. it, it was eye opening. Well, El Camino High School, when I went there, there were 2,400 kids and there were two African Americans. Right, right. So, uh, it was about as lowly white. My wife kids me, she grew up in Richmond, and she says, uh, Carmichael boy here, you know, had a very different upbringing than right. I did. <laughs> so, um, but I, I was fascinated by all that, and I, to this day, I have a lot of these guys, they're still friends, and, you know, they they come from all over the country. Right, so, right. Yeah. Um, so what's your your MOS is going to be determined by the time you get to AIT then or after? Well, actually, what happened when I enlisted? Uh, my brother was already in the service, yeah. and uh, he was airborne infantry, and uh, you know I wasn't going to let him be better than me. And so that, when I enlisted, I signed up for airborne infantry, but I wore glasses, and um, so when they brought me into uh, basic training and you know they run you through a whole battery test you know you're coughing and 
you know, leaning over and everything else. And um, <clears throat> but they told me that I couldn't go infantry, and so then I just kind of served the Army's needs at that time. And so they sent me to Fort Bliss, Texas, which, by the way, is an oxymoron. It's anything but Bliss. Yeah. Uh, down out of El Paso, Texas. <clears throat> and they put me into Hawk Air Defense missiles. Oh. And I hated every moment of that. And, uh, I, you know, I still wanted to go airborne infantry. And I'd taken a battery of tests and, and had done very well on those, much better than I did in high school. And um, there was a period of time in about 1967 where we were really starting to ramp up in Vietnam, started bringing a lot of troops in. Um, junior officers, second lieutenants, first lieutenants were at the front lines and taking heavy casualties. And so normally in order to go to like officer candidate school, you had to have a, at least a bachelor's degree. And, but in 1967, they, they lowered the standards, and I was fortunate enough to get selected for infantry officer candidate school. And so that got me out of Hawk Air Defense Missiles, got me to where I wanted to go, which yeah. was infantry. And so I went to infantry officer candidate school at Fort Benning, Georgia, and what we call Fort Benning School for Boys. There you go. Uh, I can sing the alma mater if you'd like, but I don't have much <laughs> of a voice. Uh, Anyway, I, I always thought the square meals were one of the more interesting yes. things in OCS, and uh, that was just ridiculous. But yeah, square <laughs> meal, yeah. Yeah. sitting there right. on the front four inches. Yeah, you have tape and, uh, inward four inches from the end of your chair, and you're sitting on that, and you're sitting at attention to the whole meal. That was yeah, you had fascinating. Yeah, second lieutenant tactical officers who. I was always convinced they were the most sadistic people out of the previous class. You know, I agree. And their sole purpose in life is to make your life miserable. Yeah. In fact, I have to tell a funny story. Uh, um, my tactical officer was a guy named, named uh, Lieutenant Eddie Gensel. Uh -huh. And uh, if I, to this day, if I saw him walking on the street, he'd be in danger. <laughs> uh, they were not very nice people. But, uh, you know, we, we used to, in our dr uh, dressers, we, you know, you had to have a white towel at the bottom, and oh, yeah. you know, your underwear had to be folded yeah. four inches by four right. inches, and your socks had to be folded a certain and each way. Each drawer, so yeah, many inches out. Yeah, right. and then you, you staggered out, and right. you'd have daily inspections. And uh, again, this is down in in Georgia, in you know, Columbus, Georgia, Fort Benning, yeah. and uh, they had a lot of insects down there, and. True. Uh, so when you had the inspections, if you got so many demerits, you were then restricted to the company area for the weekend. You couldn't go off out of the company area. You couldn't go downtown. Yeah. And uh, so one time, Lieutenant Gensel, during the inspection, opened up one of my drawers, and there was a cockroach in there. And the cockroach left a little calling card, yeah. you know, on this white little towel. And so he wrote me up, and I remember to this day, I had 26 demerits because of that cockroach. I got written up because I had an unauthorized pet in the company area. My pet was out of uniform, failure to have my pet on a leash. My pet had littered the company area. <laughs> and there was a whole litany of things that he wrote me up right. for. So. I got one of those. Yeah. You know, uh, in Hell Week, which I think was seventh week, um, they were really forcing you doubled up and tried to get people out. And mm -hmm. uh, I made the mistake, you know, if you had a thread hanging down that yeah. was a lanyard and lanyard you had to remove Boom. that yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. and if you had a button missing on your any place then you know you got in trouble and our TAC officer who was the best of all six platoons he was a uh, former uh, NCO African-American guy Sol Wainwright he was just a wonderful guy but he was still mean but you know uh, on a scale he was the least mean of all six mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. TAC officers so I I saw he had a button missing on the back of his pocket when we were coming out of 5th uh, Battalion classroom and I just tugged on his pocket as he was standing in front of the formation and said, need to get that fixed, sir. Well, I paid for that. He dropped the whole platoon and said, you know, you're doing this because of uh, Candidate Tribe. And mm -hmm. 11th week, we got our first on-post uh, four-hour pass. We're inspecting and he said he got me for harboring an unauthorized pet, and that was a fly on my bunk. Right. And he just, you know, 21, I think, was the break point, and he gave me 22 demerits. Mm -hmm. And I was the only one in my platoon who didn't get that far. But I said, you know what, I deserved it. You know, <laughs> it's just part of the mm -hmm. system, so. Right. Now, I mean, the, you, you'll remember uh, what's called it Blue Monday. 
which when a new uh, officer uh, candidate school class started, they were the, the mean ones. The, the, the senior company in the battalion would come over and welcome them to OCS that first Monday morning. Oh, of course, yeah. they had spent a, the previous week getting everything spit shined, you know, all their drawers put yeah. together, and you just trashed it. They and would just trash it, knock yeah. over bunks. They oh, put yeah. us all in one single bunk together, and then the next guy would harass us about, you know, why are we all sleeping together? We don't belong in the army, and then mm -hmm. they'd take us and put us in cold showers. Right. And sleeping bag drills, would you get in a sleeping bag and zip it up all the way and do grass drills like you <laughs> did in football, you know, on your feet, on your yeah. belly? Low crawl um, around that yeah. airborne track in yep. the sand, oh, yeah. you know, while you're wet. Yeah. So. In fact, I have a friend that we were talking, a guy that I used to work with for years, we were talking one time and got talking about our backgrounds and found out we both had gone to infantry officer candidate school. The guy's name is Ray Ramos and uh, lives in the Bay Area. And it turns out his uh, company was the company that my company harassed on Blue Monday, and we got seven people in his class to drop that first day. Quit. Yeah. They yeah, rang the bell and they were yeah. out. Yeah. We had the Surgeon General's son, and he, he quit. Mm -hmm. So, uh, But anyway, you finish OCS, and then you go to jump school. Right, I finished uh, officer candidate school on December 3rd of 1967, uh -huh. and uh, I was barely 20 years old. I turned 20 in October. Right. And uh, so, yeah, then I came home for Christmas leave, and then went back to Fort Benning for jump school. Uh -huh. um, three weeks of jump school. Right. Made five jumps there. Yeah. And, um, and then coming out of infantry officer candidate school, you know, about a week or two before we actually graduated, they read off our orders. And uh, so when I heard my name called, Candidate Drennan, um, Special Warfare Center, Fort Bragg, North Carolina, it was All right, right you on. got it. I got it. Yeah. I'm, I'm going where I want to go. Yeah. So. You went through the training there. All right, I went up to, um, to Fort Bragg, and uh, the officers went through a different program than, than right. enlisted. The enlisted uh, had to go through the, the Q course, the qualification course. Yeah. And um, uh, officers, we just got assigned, well, all the enlisted got assigned to the training group, uh, which had a, this is the flash, they call it, uh, yeah, the white the, flash. For the fifth. And this is the, Fifth Special Forces Group, and, and I was assigned to the Seventh Special Forces Group, which was a all red flash. Yeah. And um, you know, you would wear the beret, but because I hadn't been through the training, I wore what was called a candy stripe, which exactly. was just a little sh red strip. Me too. And so you kind of walked around the base, you know, kind of like this. You didn't want people to see <laughs> that you weren't yet Special Forces right. qualified, and you, but you were wearing a beret. Yeah. And so then I, you know, went through the Special Forces Officers course. Yeah. Um, completed that. Um, gosh, I can't remember how many weeks that was. Um, eight or ten weeks, something like I think that. It's nine. So nine, you, nine. you bracketed it. Yeah. Then. Okay. Yeah. Good. And uh, and finally got the full flash, and then uh, uh, went to uh, Jump Master School, Fort Bragg. Yeah. Uh, Seventh Special Forces Group at that time was not what we'd call an operational group. It uh -huh. was. You know, operation groups, you had the 10th Special Forces Group in Batholz, Germany. You had the 8th Special Forces Group in Panama. You had the 5th in Vietnam. Uh, the 1st was in uh, Okinawa. Yeah. So, in the 43rd Company in Thailand. Right. And then at Fort Bragg, you had the 3rd, 6th, and 7th, and, and training groups. Right. And uh, the, again, the 3rd, 6th, and 7th were more, you know, holding groups, if you will. Uh -huh. I mean, those are people who were being deployed, coming back, you know, and, right. and, and they were getting trained and all that. So, you know, I, I spent a full year training uh, with 7th Special Forces Group. Yeah. With, a lot of FTXs, field training exercises. Lots of that. Uh, yeah. Spent 30 days in, in uh, Puerto Rico. Right. So I, if we have time, I could tell you a funny story about that. Um, in fact, if you don't mind, I will tell that story. Shoot. But I was with the 7th uh, Special Forces Group and uh, uh, we went down to a 30-day exercise, field training exercise in Puerto Rico, and um, <clears throat> we completed the exercise, and uh, so we made it back to our base camp, and we're going to have a parachute jump the next day, just, you know, just for fun type of thing, and uh, 
So a bunch of us went down to the uh, Navy uh, Officers Club at Roosevelt Roads, um, Puerto Rico. Uh -huh. And so we were in the Officers Club and, um, and we were celebrating the end of our 30 days out in the field and uh, quenching our thirst. And there was this uh, guy sitting at the bar and he was a Navy officer, he was a submariner. And uh, he was what they called a Mustanger. He'd come up through right. the enlisted ranks and had been in since World War II. Now this, again, this is 19, this is 1968, so, and he'd been in since World War II, so he's well into his 40s at that time. Yeah. And uh, so we, we told him we were gonna go out and have a parachute jump the next day, and that, you know, if he was a real man, he'd, he'd come jump with us. And uh, so he said, well, I'll jump with you guys. And so we said, well, you know, go get your fatigues on. He was in civilian clothes. We told him, go get your fatigues on, and, you know, come on back out here and we'll, we'll jump you. And uh, so he leaves and we think that's the last we're going to see of this guy, right. you know. Uh, somebody's going to talk sense into him or he's going to sober up or something. But he shows up, you know, he, he's ready to go jump. Well, being special forces, we had a reputation to keep. We don't back down from anything. And so we took him out and so the next day I put him on an airplane. I happened to be the jump master. And so the Jump master is always the last guy to go out the door, and so I think we were jumping a C-123 cargo plane, and so we we're going to make two passes over the drop zone, and so I put our commander, the C team commander, I put him first man the door and a first pass just to get him out, and I, and I told the old man, the commander, that the Navy guy just wanted to observe. He didn't have a parachute on. <laughs> so as soon as we get the old man out the door, we put a parachute on this guy. Now normally, going through jump school, you had two weeks of ground training, before he actually went out of an airplane. This guy had maybe three minutes of <laughs> jump training. It was, you know, static line jump, yeah. so it's gonna pull up, you know, yeah. shoot out. And so we said- um, Keep your legs together. Yeah, keep your feet and knees together. Don't look at the ground, bend your knees, you know. Yeah. Go 1,001, 1,002, 1,003 when you go out of the plane. If you don't feel a tug, here's your reserve parachute. Here's how to open it. Right. And so uh, we put the chute on him and gave him those instructions. And by that time, it was time for the next pass over the drop zone. And I got him to the door, and he didn't hesitate. He went out, and I went right behind him. And chute opened fine. And he was yelling like a kid at Coney Island all the way down. It's the best thing he'd ever done in his life. Wow. And uh, so when we landed, I came in right behind him, gathered up his chute. And, uh, too late to make a long story short, but anyhow, that night we uh, we went back to the officers' club at Roosevelt Roads, and somebody had an extra green beret, and somebody had a pair of metal jump wings, you know, with the prongs on them, yeah. to put it through your shirt. Well, in those days, when you did your first jump with your signed outfit, what we called the cherry jump, yeah. you, you took the jump wings and you put them in a the guy's pectorals, and boom, you exactly. slammed them in. I remember that. Yeah, and uh, we all went through that. And so we made this guy an honorary member of the seven special forces group, slammed the that's, jump wings into him, and then pr proceeded to, to celebrate his accomplishment. And um, this is one of, probably the only time I ever get, really got in trouble in the military, but uh, his commanding officer, who was a Navy captain equal to an Army colonel, right. comes walking into the um, uh -oh. officer's club about this time and says, what's going on? And so. He said, I went out and jumped with these Green Berets. <laughs> and his Navy captain says, and who's in charge of this jump? <laughs> Lieutenant Drennan, sir. You know? uh, when I flew back to Fort Bragg, there was uh, a, a message for me to go see the commander of the John F. Kennedy Special Warfare Center, uh -oh. a one-star general. Right. I'm a second lieutenant. It wasn't and, General Flanagan, was it? I think that's who it was. Yeah, a little Irish guy. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, so he said, you know, I heard about what happened down there. He said, Lieutenant Drennan, he said, you're lucky he didn't auger in, you know. Um, he said, you'd be spending the rest of your life in Fort Leavenworth. He said, I'd have given you an Article 15, which is like a, a you know, minor punishment, fine yeah, and all sure. that. Um, and he said, but I know you're going to Vietnam, so you're going to get your reward there. And, and in fact, I was, I started clearing post and, and going to Vietnam. Uh, that so. was pretty gutsy of you, I have to admit that. I don't yeah. know if I would have done that. So. One of the brightest things I've ever oh, done. Well, it's in keeping with Special Forces. You finish all this pretty much a year of Special Forces training, right. and then you head for Vietnam, and that would have been when? I went to Vietnam in November of 1968. 
Okay. And uh, in fact, I had gone to Infantry Officer Candidate School with a guy named Ron Copley. Uh, went to jump school with him, went through special forces training with him, went to Vietnam with him. We had become very good friends. And in fact, uh, back in those days, you had $10,000 life insurance policies. Yep. And Ron and I named each other as the beneficiary of our life insurance oh, policies. You know, nice. just kind of a morbid sense of humor there. Yeah. And in fact, we ran into each other coming back in Cameron Bay, coming home. We had served in different parts of Vietnam. And uh -huh. We both expressed disappointment that the other guy had lived because <laughs> we were counting on that ten thousand dollars to buy a Corvette. So. Yeah, and boy, that that buy you a couple of Corvettes. Back right, then. right, <laughs> sure. Yeah, you know, I know uh, most of the guys there at Brad before everybody was going over. We uh, we bought motorcycles and muscle cars. Mm -hmm. I had a GTO and a Triumph motorcycle, and that was pretty common. I had a Corvair Spider. Oh, did you? <laughs> yeah. Um, so you get to Vietnam and you probably go to Nha Trang first. Went to our headquarters in Nha Trang yeah. um, and then was uh, uh, went to a, uh, a recon school there, about, about a week of reconnaissance school there and then I was assigned to uh, a special forces team, Detachment A502, which was about 20 kilometers west of Nha Trang. Nha Trang was on the okay. coast and so this was inland about 20 kilometers. And, and uh, is this two core or two core? Yeah, it was in okay. two core, right? All right. And um, it was an old, it had been an old French fort, and uh, A502 was the largest of all of the special forces A teams. You had the A teams, which was the forward deployed teams, yeah, typically 13 man teams. We had 20 on our, on oh, our team because we had a large area of operation, an AO to cover. Uh -huh. um, and uh, we also operated like as a mic force, mobile strike force. Sure. So uh, we would respond to, uh, you know, people in trouble. Tro people in trouble. Yeah. yeah. Um, so that's you. Pr you probably spent six months in the field, and then uh, yes, then they take you out. Got there in November, and then I, I was there until, so I recall it, it was about May of 1969. Um, they had started the Vietnamization program, turning over some of the special forces camps to the uh, Vietnamese, the Lick Long Duck Viet. Right. We call them Lick Long Duck Back. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. They, were, they were anything but special. Yeah. Uh, That's what and so wanted. when they started turning over the camp, then I then got assigned to a, a B team, which was the next command echelon up above the A teams, yeah. with B 23 and Bami Tuat up in the Central Highlands. Yeah. And. Um, I was the uh, supply officer there and, and, and had to ensure that all the eight teams under us were adequately supplied. Yeah. Spent a lot of time out there. So. Um, you were wounded. I was. Um, yeah, I, actually, the first firefight I got into was within the first week I was at A502. We went out in an ambush and a night ambush. We did a lot of those. And uh -huh. uh, so that was my first firefight. And, and, and then just operating throughout our whole area of operations. I mean, it was it was rarely a day that went by that you didn't have some kind of contact. You know? uh -huh. um, sometimes it might have just been a sniper or you know a small skirmish. Um, we operated. I mean, typically what I went out with was uh, a platoon-sized recon platoon, 25 uh, indigenous soldiers and two Americans. And uh, but yes. Uh, it was coming off one operation, and, and um, we were supposed to be picked up the next day, but we, uh, we caught some Viet Cong coming out of a, of a village just one night, and so we engaged them and uh, took care of things there. And then, so I, rather than going out the next day, I asked for permission to, to go into this village and set up ambushes around the village. Uh, and again, it was a recon platoon, and uh, so. I set up my command post in a house and had ambushes out. And this uh, this village was a in a free fire zone. After six o'clock, all the villagers had to move uh, east of a certain grid line uh -huh. uh, because it was just considered you know, enemy territory, right? Enemy controlled territory. And so, um, <clears throat> so I had the ambushes out, and then uh, at about two o'clock in the morning, I, I brought the ambushes back in, formed a, a perimeter around the command post and again we were supposed to go out the next morning and uh, 
shortly after brought the ambush teams back in, um, all hell broke loose. I mean, rocket propelled grenades were coming in. Uh, I got wounded with the first rocket propelled grenade that came in. Uh, there was all kinds of AK-47 fire coming in. I mean, was, and then, uh, um, then I moved to another position, and then an, another rocket propelled grenade came in just as I was getting ready to move again. That knocked me down again. So I was pretty well peppered with shrapnel right. from all of that. And uh, um, fortunately, we didn't lose anybody killed in action in that. We did suffer quite a few people wounded. Right. Um, that was that that whole experience right there. That that one firefight was kind of a defining moment for me in a lot of ways because you know probably one of the worst days I've ever had for a couple of reasons. You know, um, you know, first of all, the firefight, getting wounded. You know, and, and you know, the times. You know, just being out in the open and you hearing that crack. You know, when you hear a, a crack sound, that means the bullet's going. That's the speed of sound. That's yeah, breaking exactly. a sound barrier going past your ears when you hear, you know, zip, yep. you know, and then they're a little further away. But when you hear that crack, you know, it's coming in close. So, um, and then particularly when they're kicking up dirt around you, you know, yeah, you know that. Sure. So, but, um, so I, I tried to call artillery support in. They're within artillery range and, uh, you know, I had to radio, I called for artillery support and it was denied uh, because they didn't want to put artillery into this village and, you know, perhaps you know, destroy some of the homes or whatever. Right. And um, so then I called in a, uh, a gunship, Spooky, which was on a DC-3, had three Gatling guns on one side. Yeah. Each gun would fire 6,000 rounds per minute. It, it was impressive. And, uh, but even Spooky couldn't fire in the village for the same reason. They prefer, you know, if you got 18,000 rounds a minute coming out of a gun, it, it'll do a lot of damage to structures and anything else right. in its way. And so that was also denied, but at least I was able to talk to the spooky pilot and tell him to, you know, to bring some fire in toward the edge of the, the village. And, and, yeah. and the Viet Cong, they knew what spooky was. And so uh, with that, they, they then broke contact. And uh -huh. so we we're, you know, then out of the fight. But, and about that time, the sun was starting to come up and we're counting casualties and, you know, taking inventory of things. And then I, um, <clears throat> you know, and, and you know, all of our soldiers were, were Moniards, which were the tribal hill people, the Central right. Highlands. And uh, um, I mean, they were great people, very supportive of us, very protective of us. And, but, you know, they were looking at me and, and knowing that we had these resources of artillery and spooky and everything else, and they couldn't understand why I couldn't bring it into the village, you know, where we knew where the bad guys were, you yeah. know, but we, we, I couldn't bring it in. And they couldn't understand that. I couldn't understand it, you know, so I couldn't explain it. I couldn't explain the politics of war to them sure. and rules of engagement. They didn't understand. But so in the morning, I then get a coded message from our team. And, uh, and I'm, I get on the radio and I, and I tell our team, look, the bad guys know where I am. You don't have to put this message in code. Just tell me what's going on, you know? And so I'm laying on the ground and each of us special forces guys had a mountain yard, uh, like a bodyguard. I mean, these guys didn't leave your side and they, they just took personal responsibility for us. But I had my bodyguard, he, he was sitting, sitting up right next to me and I was laying on the ground decoding, you know, got my code book out and I'm decoding this message. And all of a sudden, you know, I hear helicopters in the background and all of a sudden I hear a machine gun go off and I see dirt kicking up right, right near me and I'm thinking, my God, the Viet Cong have now come back at us and we're out here in the open. And, uh, and, I, and I looked up and this Montagnier is sitting next to me, he looked up like this and caught a M60 machine gun on right through here, you know, and it just took out everything, you know, which went all over me, you know, yeah. and uh, I mean, it's, it, it, it's something I, I love to this yeah. day, you know, and uh, friendly fire. It was friendly fire, and uh, I mean, he was a great guy, you know, and uh, should not have happened, right. you know, and but it did, and yeah. what happened, and situations like that, but but you know. It, yeah. When I went to Vietnam, I went over with a certain level of, you know, 
uh, I hate to say patriotism, you know, but, you know, kind of a raw, raw share. But that moment <clears throat> kind of redefined the war for me. It's like, you know, we're out here on the front lines, and you got people in Washington, D.C. or wherever, or sitting back in the train, you know, uh, restricting us on what we can do. You know, we're, we're pawns in some political game. So, yeah. So it, it kind of changed my view on the war. Yeah. And, you know, and, and, you know, and I think most Vietnam veterans would tell you that when they went there, you know, they weren't mm -hmm. fighting for motherhood and apple pie and, and all of that. It was, you know, you, you were fighting for the guys on either side of you right. and, and fighting, trying to get home. And you, you weren't fighting for some grand ideal, anything like that. It was yeah. fundamental, basic survival. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Um, were you wounded any other time that you were out in the field? No. no. Well, that's good. To get it over with, at least. I'm sorry? To get it over with. Yeah, first yeah, week. yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so you, you ets if I remember right, Thanksgiving of 69. Thanksgiving Day, 1969, uh, uh, I got told to pack my stuff up, it was time to go home, and, yeah. um, Went down to Cameron Bay, ran into my friend Ron Copley. We flew back together on Flying Tiger Airlines. Uh, got into McCord Air Force Base up in the Seattle area. Uh -huh. And um, <clears throat> it was in the early morning hours. And uh, uh, I got put in charge of one group of people that had come back from Vietnam that were getting out of the service. There was others who were going on to other assignments but there was a group of us that were getting out of the military, and so I was put in charge of that group to get them through the whole clearance process. Uh -huh. And I can say that in the two years I was a commissioned officer, I only pulled rank one time, and uh, I had told this group of guys, I said, we're gonna double time from station to station. I'm gonna have you guys on an airplane to get home for Thanksgiving dinner. And uh, we got this one station, and there was a specialist fourth class, and. He wasn't going any place. He wasn't going home. He hadn't just got back from Vietnam, he was and, in and uh, you know, and he's talking to his, his buddy, and, and he's not pushing the paperwork. Right? I had my green beret on, and so I put both hands on his desk in front of him, gave him the hard eye contact, and I said, "Specialist, if you don't have me on an airplane in time for Thanksgiving dinner, I'm going to have your ass." And he said, "Yes, sir." <laughs> And we made it on an airplane, and we all got home for Thanksgiving dinner. Yeah, I think you saw quite a bit of that sort of thing. Yeah. yeah. Well, and then after the service, what did you do? After the service, I uh, again I got back uh, Thanksgiving Day and, and immediately enrolled in college in American River College and uh, um, started classes in January, and then uh, transferred over to Sac State and, and uh, Sacramento State and uh, completed my bachelor's degree. Uh, at Cal State Sacramento, and, uh, and that was in uh, January of 1974. And uh, then I, uh, I'd always wanted to move to the Bay Area. I wanted to live in the big city for a while, you know, with the intention of coming back to Sacramento. And I moved down to San Francisco, lived there for several years, and, and um, ended up settling there. And just never made it back home. You got married and had kids. Got married. Got and I have a son and a daughter. Uh, my daughter is uh, 29, and uh, she got married a year and a half ago to a Danish guy, a real good guy. I got to say that because he's bigger than I am. <laughs> uh, no, he's he's really a good guy, and uh, and our, both kids. My daughter went to uh, Syracuse University, got her undergraduate, and, and then uh, our son went to Colorado School of Mines in Golden, Colorado, and majored in geological engineering, so he completed that, and he's working as a ge geological engineer in Colorado. Uh -huh. And our daughter went over to visit him, and she was thinking about graduate school. She liked what she saw, so she signed up for graduate school, and so this coming August she will defend on her Ph.D. and oh, nice. walk in December, so must be real proud, proud of both of them. Yeah. Yeah. And you worked uh, for several public different public agencies? Right, I spent my whole career in, in public service and uh, doing real estate actually and uh -huh. started off, my first job was working for the uh, U.S. Postal Service real estate and so I traveled all over the western United States uh, buying sites for post offices and leasing buildings for post offices and then went to work for the Naval Facilities Engineering Command in San Bruno and as a real estate appraiser and then worked up and became 
the uh, director of real estate there for a number of years and until that base got closed when they closed all the Bay Area military bases. And then I went over to the Army Corps of Engineers as their regional director of real estate for eight years, retired from there, took a weekend off, and then uh, went to work for the city of Mountain View. And I've been there for the last ten and a half years. Okay. But there's light at the end of the tunnel, you know, the retirement tunnel. <laughs> yeah. and that light's getting bigger. I, I've been doing that for some time now. <laughs> well, Dennis, I want to thank you for coming in today. Uh, you and your brother David a real are pleasure. major heroes to me, and I, uh, I'm proud of you and proud of your service. And so, It was an honor to serve yeah. with some real special people, I'll yeah. tell you. Well, thank you. That completes uh, this episode of Valley of Vietnam. Uh, tune in next time for our next episode. Thank you.